Good morning, all. We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, not sure how long this will take, which y'all are familiar with me. That's kind of the way that it works. Um, before we get started, uh, the sheets that I handed out that had scriptures on them, there's primarily four that I would like people to read. They're the ones that are boldened, and I think that should be three, four, five, and six on the list. Like I said, I've explained to y'all the reason I give you the other scriptures is because I'm referring to them, and I don't ever want you to think I'm pulling something out of the air or, or, or you know, talking and for my own reference because sometimes I forget where something's coming from so that's why those are on there. If we have time down at the end I may ask somebody to read one or two of those scriptures but it's more for time that uh, I have it the list the way that I do. So could I ask somebody uh, to read the third one and I don't even remember what order because I don't have the list in front of me. I can read it. The, the third one that's on the list you got it? Yeah. Uh, I was going to get this list and then I will. Uh, whoever's the third one or the fourth one, okay. she, you got James, whatever's the one underneath that. Corinthians. Corinthians, thank you. Luke. You got Luke, then Sharon, and one other. Hey, when y'all decide, I don't want to. She got first Timothy. Okay, first He's got first Timothy. That, that's four. Okay, we got him. <laughs> We're reading the Bible. You can't go wrong, right? <laughs> <laughs> can't go wrong <laughs> so all right well look, before we get started now that we got that sign let's pray okay father god we um here for one reason and that's because we love you first foremost we're humbled and broken hearted from what you did for us we could never thank you enough so today as we open your word father and it encourages us to be a committed follower of yours to walk with your spirit, Father. I just pray that the opening of your word um, is a blessing to you as we know it will be to us, Father, and that it's not something shallow, which actually we will end on one of these scriptures, Father, that we just hear and don't apply it to us, but we will go away different because we've heard your word and it's inspired and encouraged us. So again, be blessed by this uh, study and just have your words be said, not ours. I pray these things in your name. Amen. Okay, um, what do we remember about last week's study? Community, that is exactly correct. A growing follower of Jesus engages in community. We do what we're doing here. Uh, we do it in, in connect groups. If you're involved in a connect group, I hope you are. And I, I know we cannot be involved in everything, so I'm not judging if you don't have the time or unable to make it to these but get plugged in. Be a part, even if it's calling up another church member and, hey, let's go get coffee every other Tuesday or, or something, whatever works for you. Be involved, not just in this building, be involved in each other's lives. That's what we were talking about last week. And it was primarily the scripture, the main scripture that we went about would have been Colossians 3, 12 through 7 that says, Therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a grievance against another. Above all, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. And let the peace of Christ, to which you were also called in one body, rule your hearts and be thankful. It's kind of funny that that correlates with what we've been going through in, in our uh, preaching. Be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell richly among you in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing to God with gratitude, again thankful, in your hearts. And whatever you do in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. I know I beat this, and I know that we just went through this, and if you don't think you have something to be thankful for, then you don't know Jesus Christ. Sorry, it's that blunt. Now, do we go through struggles? Are some people going through worse struggles, whether it be financial, whether it be through health, whether it be through a depression, hurt? We, different people go through different things and you struggle. You still have something to be thankful for if you know Jesus Christ. And it's the greatest thing to be thankful for because as we go through those struggles that we inevitably will go through, it's temporary. It might seem like a long time while you're going through it, through these struggles. I remember Marine Corps boot camp. I didn't think it would ever end. This life will end. Uh, 
we were doing praise team practice this morning, and somebody said something about if something went wrong. It said, it's not the end of the world. And I said, not yet, but the day's early. <laughs> Who knows? He may come today. Are we prepared? That is something to be thankful for. We uh, have been helping my brother down at Christmas in the country down in Deltona. If you have a chance, go down there. It is a great thing to see. Fridays and Saturday nights between 6. They close the gates at 8, but we're normally there until 9.30 because everybody that comes in has the chance to do the hayride. They hear the gospel presented in a different way. Yes, they come for the hayride. They come for the lights, but they hear the gospel. But we're tired, and the church members of his that are working are tired, and they sit there and think, Maybe God will come tonight. <laughs> so we ain't got to do this again tomorrow night. It's a blessing to do. But whatever it is, it's temporary because he is coming again. So that is what we need to be thankful for, if nothing else. Um, scripture there gives us very clear commands as how we're supposed to engage in community that I just read. Love one another through compassion, kindness, humility, meekness. Live in harmony with one another, which may be difficult. So sometimes you temper the amount of time you spend with somebody. If they are not your cup of tea, doesn't mean you don't love them, doesn't mean you don't spend time, you don't help them. But I think sometimes that is a healthy thing to do is know and understand that they may be a struggle. Okay, I need some time away for prayer after I've been with this person for a while. But loving and humility and kindness and get along. Teach and admonish one another through the word. People say, oh, you can't judge me. That's not what scripture says about like-minded believers. But it also tells us, remember, to examine the plank in your eye before you examine the splinter in your brothers. But we are called steel on steel. We are called to lift each other up, admonish each other when something's going on. So be a part of that. Sing praises through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, and be thankful to God. Today we're going to be looking at how a growing follower of Jesus should be maturing spiritually. That should go without saying. It doesn't, but it should. You cannot be a living organism and not be growing. And that is the same thing about a God organism, a child of God. You are either growing or you're dying. There is no in between. When it comes to children, what is a sign of good health? Some of us are newly grandparents. And newer, coming more again. But you still, I mean, Theo's not that old. Growing, growing maturing. Uh, you can see the growth in a, in a child if they are healthy. You can see the physical growth usually. And that's a sign that they're growing. And, and development. A lot of times they become better at, at things. I sit there and look at uh, my young granddaughter. And it's like, I went one time and it's like, they are constantly giving that child a bottle. I go the next time, she still has no teeth, and she will eat them under the table. I have never seen anything like this. They just got to get it small enough, and she, there's nothing she won't eat. Well, except green beans, they found out. She doesn't care for those. Meat, I mean, they are literally tearing up meat. She still has no teeth, and she loves pork, let me tell you. And rice and beans, you're, you're, you're changing you're, what you can do. I know that sounds silly, but that is a sign of a healthy child. They're changing the things that they can do. They have a recognition. They have a recognition of things that are going on around them. This child, my grandchild, the phone or iPad or whatever my daughter-in-law uses when she puts her, she sees, particularly my wife, but me too, and immediate recognition. It wasn't there before. It's just a blank stare into space. Things change. They start picking up. They learn. They grow. You can see that maturity in them. What is a sign of a healthy mind? A little more challenging to come up with. How do you say it? <laughs> this is live streaming, remember? <laughs> memory. Now, as a young person, though, it's not as much memory because them kids suck it all up, but Understanding? Yeah. Well, what goes through your brain? In other yes. Words, what are you thinking about? Are you thinking good thoughts? Or... Now, now, that is usually as a more mature person, not as a child, because usually you can't judge that, but that is correct. When you're talking about an adult, if we're talking about a child, it is understanding of stuff. How many times do you burn your finger on the same thing, touching it when somebody says it's hot? Hopefully once at the most. It's hot. Okay, I learned from that one. I understand this. I'm not going to do this again. Now, some of us, again, my wife keeps telling me I need to wear a helmet because I hit my head on everything. I almost continually have scars or a trickle of blood off the top of my head. And she keeps threatening to make me wear a helmet in everything that I do. So some of us don't learn. Maybe my maturity there is waning. But 
understanding, knowledge, wisdom of things is a sign of healthy growth in a child and in people. What is the sign of a healthy growth in a church body? Getting together, community like we were talking about last week. Support. Supporting each other. That's part of that community, exactly. Uplift. Yeah, and, and you're right. We talked about that. It wasn't last week. I think it was two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Stewardship. That is maturity. If you understand, it's not about, God does not need your money. He wants your obedience. And that is part of stewardship. You know, people hate the term tithe. I, I don't care. I don't care what word you use. I use obedience, whatever it is, however God leads you and calls you. That is part of it. People sometimes look at numbers. Sometimes that's it. But sometimes it's these things. Well, I say sometimes. I believe, I believe that those things are more important because they show the spiritual growth of a church. And a lot of times it may be very slow that the physical growth as far as numbers comes along with it. But if you are being, we are being as a church body and as individuals being obedient to God and we're growing individually, that means we're going to be obeying God's word, which means going and telling others about Jesus Christ, which guess what then happens? That means it multiplies, so the numbers become bigger. I don't care if somebody that I am blessed to lead to Christ or convinced to go hear the word of God, I don't care if it's here. I want it to be somewhere where they hear the word of God. Now, would I love them to become whoever it may be? I'm just talking generically, become part of this church body because I know what our community and our heart is like here. Yes, I told my kids when they matured, if y'all raised kids, I said, when you graduate from high school or you turn 18, I don't care where you go to church. Now, I will assess it and render my opinion, but you're a grown person. But while you live under my roof, you are going to church. Now, that's not an issue. My children, faithful, serving wherever they're at, all three states all over this country, they're serving. But when they were young, again, teaching them, helping them gain wisdom, I said, you're going somewhere. And it's the same thing with new believers, being somewhere under the word of God, again, so it might not be here. If the body or the... I'm sorry, ma'am? Or you came in late the night before and got three hours sleep? Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Sometimes you don't want to go. Now, I don't think, I think there's an issue if you were constantly not wanting to go and you just go because... You know, and I was a young person. I know you might not get as much out of it. Hopefully you are. So your parents make you and you go because of that. But as a mature Christian, you should want to be around other believers. Yes, are there going to be days that we get up and don't want to go because nasty weather, my back hurts, my whatever hurts, my sciatic, my neck, my head, whatever. All of them hurt. But yes, spiritual maturity is wanting to be around like-minded believers. I'm going to read Galatians 5, 16 through 26. Galatians 5, 16 through 26. That is on your list, but I'm going to read that one for time. I say then, walk by the Spirit, and you will certainly not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is against the Spirit, and the Spirit desire, desires what is against the flesh. These are opposed to each other so that you don't do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, strife, jealousy, outburst of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and anything similar. I am warning you about these things, as I warned you before, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The law is not against such things. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another or envying one another. So this scripture tells us about what people of the flesh are doing. They are walking by the flesh, and it tells us about the Spirit. What does Paul mean here? Now, remember this is Paul writing to the church in Galatia, and he's encouraging them, but he's also warning them about how to live, which is what we've been talking about, this walk, abiding with Christ, and he's giving us, just as he did the church in Galatia, practical application as to how to walk, how to abide in Christ through the Holy Spirit. What does Paul mean when he says walk by the Spirit? Well, if, if you've accepted Christ, you've put off 
flesh. Correct. Correct. The part that you just said, though, if you are in step right. with the yeah. Spirit, yeah. you can ditch all these bad things, but if you do, what takes its place? You are supposed to be guided by the Holy Spirit. We have to have. A God, if you're in military battle, your commanding officer, your commanding non-commissioned officer gets killed, gets taken out of the battle somehow, first thing that they do is a field promotion because you have to have a leader because the first thing that you're trained to do is obey orders. Now, you're trained to be a rifleman. You're trained to do the things, and, and, and if you're a good, just as us, as good believers, if a leader, something happens to the leader, you're still prepared to go into battle. And that's spiritual battle as well. We should be prepared to do that. But they pro, pro, uh, do a field promotion because there needs to be a leader. We need to know, okay, are we going to hold fast? Are we going to go? Are we going to go this direction? It's the same thing. You put away those bad things. The Holy Spirit helps us put away those bad things, but it's guidance. He is telling us, in step with the Holy Spirit. He gives us the direction to go. The alternative to walking by the Spirit is walking by the flesh, which is what we're trying to put away in the first place. Scripture tells us, specifically there in verse 17 that I just read, that the Spirit and the flesh are in opposition to one another, meaning that we within us have a dual nature and they battle. Who do we feed? If you're feeding the fleshly nature, that one's going to win. If you're feeding, spending time, and being led by the Holy Spirit, then that one will win. To, talk, to walk by the Spirit is to live according to the Spirit, not according to the flesh, which is what Paul tells us how to do in there. Paul is just now coming from a thesis where he wrote to the church in Galatia here just before this in the previous chapter, talking about the freedom that Jesus, salvation through Jesus Christ, him dying on the cross and conquering sin, the freedom that he gave us. He said that Christ died to set us free. That's what he just talked about. Paul said that he talked about free from death, but also free from sin. Scripture tells us if we are living in the Holy Spirit and allowing him to guide us, we keep saying, well, my human nature, I sinned, I sinned. We are human. We do fail. But Scripture tells us the Holy Spirit gives us the ability not to sin. So if we sin, we're not listening to him. Scripture tells us we have the ability not to sin because of the Holy Spirit in us. He says in verse 13 that you, we as believers, were called to be free, but don't use that freedom to sin or give in to the flesh. He says to serve one another through love. Here he says that the freedom that Christ gave us through his death and his resurrection is under attack. That's what Paul is warning about by the things of the flesh, the things that are out there calling you to it, whatever it may be. And if you read down through that list and you're like, oh, I'm not promiscuous. I don't worship idols. I don't defy you to tell me that you don't struggle with one of those things. Now, don't raise your hand. I'm just saying <laughs> at, at least one. It, it may be self-control. Uh, uh, one of the other scriptures we'll read in a minute talks about fits of anger. I don't think that necessarily means, you know, throwing things through the wall. Although I have to admit I did break a knuckle one time. Uh, I have matured some. <laughs> These things, they really, patience, it, it talks about that in there. There are things that we struggle with, and everybody's not necessarily the same. But all these things are things that are attacking our freedom. In the previous verses, he is warning against being subverted by legalism in an attempt to win salvation through the law. You cannot win salvation through the law, and that's what Paul just said. But he also warns against, now get this big word here. You can write this one down. Don't. It is antinomianism. Big fancy word. I actually like it. While I was doing my studies, I came across that word. And I mean, it's something that we talk about that it, we know that occurs in the Scripture. But what this word means, it's a big word that refers to the fact that the grace of God saves us from every sin. I think I may have commented about this before, that uh, George Clooney movie where he's, uh, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? One or what ends up being two boys, but these three guys that escape from the chain gang are going through the woods, and they see these people in white robes going down into the water to be baptized. And the one goes running down there in the water, and he comes back out, and he says, Boys, I've been saved from my sins. He said, I've been saved from every sin that I ever did. He said, I've even been saved from that robbery that I did at the Piggly Wiggly. 
And George Clooney says, you said you didn't do that robbery. He said, well, I lied, but I've been saved from that sin too. <laughs> it's the truth. But that freedom, that word antinomianism refers to there was a belief at that time, I've been freed by grace, so I can live however I want because God's taking care of me. If you want to apply this out, you know, you extrapolate in math calculations, yes, technically that is true because there is no sin you can or will commit that Jesus Christ has not shed his blood for every single one, even lying about the robbery at the Piggly Wiggly. But I do not believe for a second that you can live that life doing these things if you are truly called and have the Holy Spirit living within you. Because you back up in those doggone verses and it says those two are against each other. The spirit and the flesh are completely against each other. So it doesn't work that way. Light and dark do not go. They don't live together. When light comes into a room, the darkness is gone. They can't be together. And it's the same thing with this. You're not living in the flesh. That antinomianism, uh, the word comes from two Greek words, anti, which, I mean, you see that in everything. Anti just means against, basically. And gnomes, not gnomes, but it's spelled the same, <laughs> means uh, law. It actually refers to the law. An old Greek word, it refers to the law. So it means against the law. In other words, they could do, they practice this thing that they could do whatever they want because of the grace of God. That he is saying, no, it doesn't work that way because the Holy Spirit doesn't allow that. He says, you're freed, but don't try and abuse that freedom by simply claiming I'm forgiven of all my sins and I'm going to do whatever I want. It does not work that way because light and dark don't get along. Flesh and spirit do not live side by side. And walking by the Spirit, yes, your salvation is a one-time decision. You accept Christ. You allow Him to come into your life. That is a one-time decision, but walking by the Spirit is not a one-time decision. That is a daily thing that we have to do every single day. I think I've referred to this before. My brother, when he was going to seminary, all the things that happened to him, I mean, you know that he was under spiritual attack. He got where every single day he would get up and read through the Scripture where it talks about the spiritual armor of God. And literally, mom putting on every single piece. And it was every single day while he was going to seminary because he knew he was going to be under attack. Every single day is my point. We are in spiritual battle every single day. We have to walk by the Spirit every single day. We have to make that decision every single day. Illustration here, you're going down a road, okay? Bad road, good road. Okay, I made the right decision. I'm on the good road. It doesn't end there. Because you're going to come to another fork in the road. It's not one time. It's not, you know, in the country, take the right turn by the barn and you're good to go. It's continuing. Daily, daily making that. At each intersection, you have to make a choice on which direction you're going to go. This is why Jesus tells us that we must take up our cross daily. That's in Luke 9, 23. I hope I put that one down there. Luke 93 is where Jesus speaks about us picking up our uh, cross and carrying it daily. Now, according to verses 19 through 21, you can look in your scripture there, what does walking by the flesh produce? Sorry? Sin. Sin. <laughs> yes, ma'am. That, that pretty much covers them all. <laughs> but what are some of them specifically? Jealousy. Jealousy is one down there. Yes, ma'am? Hatred. I'm sorry? Hatred. Hatred. Fits of anger, your translation, you know, may be different. Rage, fits of anger is what mine says. What else? Strife. Strife. Now, see, this is the part that I was talking about. You're like, no, I'm not one of those that flies off the handle. No, I'm not out running around sexual immorality, sexual impurity, promiscuity, idolatry. That, that's not me. But we sitting there sometimes in a class and unintentionally start, did you hear about so-and-so? And this happens in church. And sometimes, and I'm not going to say I haven't been guilty of this. I strive so hard not to. In the shroud of a prayer request, you hear what so-and-so did? So-and-so's pregnant. They're not even married. Did you hear what so-and-so got caught doing? Did you hear dissension of any kind? We should be doing everything that we can to stop that stuff. Whatever it may be. And I'm not saying that anything happened. Okay, so these were not examples. These were just things that I'm saying that we may, we have to be careful of. Creating dissension of any time. I don't get along with that person, so I'm not going to be in their Sunday school class. I don't like, 
if it's the word of God, it's not going to return void anyway. Now, I'm not saying if you don't like the way somebody teaches or, their partic- or that particular topic this time that you need to go into the class just to prevent strife. But do everything scripture tells us. Do everything within your power to live in harmony. That is what scripture tells us. And that's what it's talking about here, these little things. Jealousy. Are, are, are we jealous? She sang on the praise team four out of five weeks. He only called me once. I, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I look straight ahead. I'm trying not to look at anybody. But I, I, I know who's on the praise team. So I didn't. That, <laughs> no. Actually, actually, I looked at Rhonda first, and I looked away specifically. And, and, I, and then my hand goes that way, and it's not at Rhonda. That, but I saw the people that are on the praise team. We're just practicing together. You get my point, though. That you might think that. Yeah. <laughs> You may think that that's no big deal. Yes, it can be if you let it be. I, people, I, I told John when he came on here, I said, I know I'm an old fuddy-duddy. Our music is more upbeat. Her son, great, her son, great leader. They are, this is young stuff. I can't even keep up with and say the words. I'm like, John, I don't have to be. He said, no, I won't. I said, when you want me serving, you let me know. If you want this to move in a different way, you are not going to hurt my feelings. I, people, I, I know it's easy to say, I don't care. I, I, I really don't. I love getting up there and praising God. I hope you're not looking at me when I'm doing it. I love that. I can do that from my pew. If you don't hear it, if you sit down at the other end of the pew sometimes, you probably get annoyed at me because I get to playing the drums, and I don't know how to play the drums on the back of the pew. God moves in my heart and it comes out. I don't care. I'll sing his praises from the back row. I'll sing his praises in the back room. I'll do it sitting out in the lobby looking at the cameras. Where do you want me to serve? God, lead me. Lead that man to ask me where he wants me. I don't care. You know, I've been asked to do different. Sometimes I do not feel led that way, and I will say no. Most of the time, unless God literally says I don't want you, and and it's not in my you know, he's not saying it vo- ver- verbally, but sometimes it's pretty obvious when God has said, not at this time. But most of the time, sure, you want me to serve? I'm available. Where, when, how? I do my best. And, and that's not about me. That's not the point. These little things, that's not mine. Like I said, I have a broken finger, so you can tell what one of mine may be. Jealousy at knit, but those are things. Certain people sometimes, and like I said, I'm trying to, my eyes are roaming. I'm not looking at anybody. But dissension, the, 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 the talking down, the rumoring, the whatever, that's all these things that are in there. Dissensions, divisions are actually listed as two different things. You think maybe there's a reason? I think of them as the same thing, but it's listed as two separate things because it is important. Rivalries, envy, all those different things that are listed. Now, most of us, like I said, can claim, oh, most of those don't apply, but then there may be one of those. Patience, self, you know, self-control, whatever it is. But in Converse, starting in 21, so much more important, what are we replacing it with? What does verse 21 tell us that the fruits of the flesh are? That we haven't gotten to the fruits of the Spirit. What does it say, though, in verse 21 about these fruits of the f- flesh? Is that list all encompassing? What's it say? Depending on your translation, things like these, things like this, that's not it. You know, you can put et al, if you're a writer, at the end of that, there's more. We have to be careful of the things that we allow when we're in the flesh. It is a summary list of sinful behavior that may have been obvious in the Galatian church at the time that they may have been familiar with, but it is definitely not all-inclusive. Trust me, we can come up with new sins. Mankind's never had an issue with that. Note that verse 19, though, says that the works of the flesh are evident. If you are living in the flesh, you cannot deny it. Now, you can say you can't judge me, and you can try to justify, and we've all been there and done that. I'm I'm saying me. I I find it hard to believe that everybody at some point has just, I'm tired. I'm not going to give this month because dot, dot, dot. I'm not going to church the next three weeks because I got, and if you take a three-week vacation, that's not what I'm saying. But just not joining with God's people just because you decide you don't want to. They're evident. It's evident. And it's evident to you. Don't tell me it's not. You you know it. You can justify it. You can hide from it. You can run from it. But it's evident. It's evident to others. And it, it says so in the scripture. And it's evident to yourself. But what does verse 22? Remember, I, I said my, I, I, you can't say that there are favorite words in the Bible. But if I had... 
two favorite words. It's but God. Because man does all this junk to mess up everything that they do. Their own lives, the lives of others, their nation, the temple, the church, the whatever. But God. So what does verses 22 and 23 tell us that the Spirit produces in contrast to all that? Goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, like somebody said, forbearance, self-control. Like I said, we each have issues. I don't put heroes, but there are people in the church that have certain characteristics that I strive after. Like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm striving to be like Christ. But God also puts godly people in your path that are good examples to you sometimes that encourage you and remind you when you're starting to get whatever it may be. And it's like, hmm, okay. So, and my wife is the first. If you are married, should be the first part of encouragement and correction for you. Uh, yes, I have godly men around me. But your spouse should be number one. And my wife has been. And there have been times in our life, and our marriage, and it's not that I'm intentionally not listening to God. Guess what? Sometimes it's harder to ignore my wife than it is God because she speaks in a louder voice <laughs> most of the time. So they're put in the path to remind us, to encourage us, whether it be our spouses or other people. So, yes, ma'am. I know in my Bible is the fruit is visible expression of character. It's the outside of what's actually in you. You know, they said that uh, character is shown by what you do when people, when nobody sees you or some, something along those lines. And that's exactly when nobody's looking, whatever it is. That's the truth. And I can tell you, like I said, one little thing starts you heading down the wrong road. We have police officers that have had issues, and it starts from something minor. You go into a house where you're arresting people for drugs, and usually where there's drugs, there's money. Nobody will notice. I, I mean, I'm just being honest. Most police officers know but it happens and then like I said then that starts it on down the road you you pull that one little string on something that is your weakness you know people are like let's go to the club let's go to and we're all adults in here the topless clubs or whatever you call them you know I know people have bachelor parties there let's nope nope I'm going home like I said if there are things that you're aware that could be a problem for you what does scripture say about sin Run. It literally says flee, which translates also run. I get in my car and I take my backside home. Where I got that loud voice reminding me of, you know. I, I, I'm serious. You avoid the things that you know maybe I never, never go anywhere. I, I mean, when I say never, I meet men for breakfast, prayer breakfast. You know, these don't go to the clubs. And when I was in Altamont, the whole time, the guys would get together after work. I went one time. With my wife, we went, they are drinking beer and throwing darts. Said, okay, been there, done that. Never went again. Came up here to Jacksonville, was invited to go. They'd go, guy said, we used to work the midnight shift. Said, they'd go watch the Monday night football on the days that we were off because we worked the late shift and on the two. And I told my wife, I'm going to go one time, see what it's like, because I know what cops are like. And I go there and they said, bring some food and we'll watch and play penny ante poker. Um, show up, I said, one time. And I go, <laughs> Nobody drank. Nobody did anything except watch football and everything else. And then I find out that they'll get together two times, and the third time that they get together, the wives and or girlfriends or whatever are invited too. They really do. They just did it for the fellowship. Now, most of them weren't believers, but I'm like, okay. I told my wife. I said, maybe I can be an influence on them. Oh, and on the food thing, when they said bring food, I brought chips and stuff. So they're bringing lasagna, you know, and I'm like, okay, guys, listen, I'm new here at the department. I'm, I'm, I'm learning, but, I mean, they're bringing food, food. To, to eat at 10 o'clock at night, you know. So avoid it. If, if there's an issue, if there's a point of temptation or whatever, flee from that sin. But it says that these are the fruits of the Spirit. But in the same way that it says they're evident, it also says this about the fruits. In the same way that the fruits of the flesh were not an exhaustive list, the fruits of the Spirit are not either. There are so many different things that display the love of God within us if we are walking with the Spirit. Notice in verse 23, it says, against such things there is no law, indicating that it is not just the specific items mentioned in this list because it gets, says such things, that there is no law. Is the decision to walk by the Spirit something that comes naturally? No. no. 
at least not when we're born before we're reborn. Because what does it refer to so many times in the spirit, in the scripture, before you have been saved? What do they refer to that particular self? The natural self. That is literally the word that they use in, in many of the scriptures. The natural self. So that means, no, it's not natural. But what makes it natural? The Holy Spirit, because we are no longer that natural person that we are. Now, does part of it reside within us? Until Christ comes again, we are not perfected. Paul himself says, I'm not perfect. Now, he puts himself up on a pedestal sometimes and says, as much as you can, be like me. I'm not doing that. But Paul followed Christ. We have to have some discipline in ourselves because that doesn't come naturally. That is the walking by the Spirit through obedience and discipline. We discipline our children as well to learn. So we need to discipline ourselves so that we're not giving in. And, and people say desires of the flesh, and immediately you think of sexual immorality, promiscuity, whatever. That's not desire. Yes, that is a couple, but that whole list, desires, that's because the fleshly self wants it, whatever it is whether it be toys, whether it be money, whether, which to me that's idolatry if you put such a value on it. And I'm not picking on anybody. They got their boat. They got their, I have an RV, I admit it. D blame that on my kids. Uh, moving away from me. It's, it's not about the things. It's how it, what it means to you, where it is in a priority to your life. What is the priority? That's where it becomes things of the flesh. Um, here in Galatians 5, Paul also used four distinct verbs to designate the spirit-controlled life of the believer. Verse 16, he says, walk by the spirit. Verse 18, he says, to be led by the spirit. 25, the first part of 25, he says, to live by the spirit. And in 25b, the second half, he says, to keep in step with the spirit. Each of these verbs describes not a laid-back thing. It's a dynamic thing. It is something that you are doing. It takes action. It is a verb, not a noun. That means you are doing something. You are walking in the Spirit, walking with the Spirit, walking guided by the Spirit. It is a verb. It takes a doing something. It's kind of like when we're talking about how fast something's going. This, I, I knew because of what I did in accident reconstruction. When you talk about how fast something's moving, what do you refer to it in? How do you gauge? Not the number, but like the speed limit signs Miles out there. What is? Miles per hour. Or if you happen to be in Japan or Europe, kilometers per hour. That is how fast. Well, what does velocity mean? Speed. Am? Speed. Speed. It's kind of the same thing, but see, the definition is the difference between just going and being guided. Velocity, the definition, is a speed, but it's also included with a direction. Now, it's measured in feet per second. That doesn't matter. But it gives a direction. Speed's just how fast. Velocity is speed in a direction. How fast you're going in a direction. That's what the Holy Spirit, you can waste all the time you want in good stuff. I think I mentioned the last time that I taught, I don't even remember which class it is, that they do this on me. But I was talking about, I know some good people that did some incredibly good things and unfortunately died and went to hell. Now, not our place to judge, but just in conversations with these good people. They were good people. And they were going and doing great things, but not being guided by the Holy Spirit. So they're good things, but they're shallow. Because like I said, when I said that, you know, Christ is coming again, he's coming again and we're going to die. And Billy Graham, I saw, I don't, we were down at my brother's and you get very few TV channels because he doesn't have cable and whatever. We were in our camper, so it's whatever came on the stream. We saw a Billy Graham classic and he said, it's not difficult. He said, people, it's a huge decision, but it's not difficult. You either choose for him or you choose against him. You're either going the right way or you're going the wrong way. And that's exactly what it is. You're either following the Holy Spirit. The Greek word for walk not only means to walk around after or around with someone, it's meant to uh, be around with somebody in a particular direction. In Paul's vocabulary, that meant to walk with the Spirit or to be led, led by the Spirit. It means where the Spirit is going. You're not just ambly roaming around doing whatever you think is good. You know, sometimes, and, and we all do it, and it's not because we say it that I think it's wrong. We just have to be careful that we don't mean it when we say it. Well, I think we should. That's dangerous. We should be praying and asking, even in the small things. And you say, well, that, that's my, yeah, those small things lead to bigger things. 
We should be guided by the Holy Spirit in everything. We should have a direction, not just roaming around. We should be constantly guided by the Holy Spirit. What are some steps that we can take to promote spiritual growth in a way that helps us to walk with the Holy Spirit? You know, you raise your kids, you discipline them, you guide them, you show them the right thing, you feed them, you do whatever. Well, what are things that we can mature spiritually? How can we do that? Praying. Praying is a huge one. Staying in the Word. Who has James 1, 22 through 25? of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror for he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like but the one who looks into the perfect law the law of liberty and perseveres being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts he will be blessed in his doing being doers, not just hearers. I know that I've had this discussion before. It's great to study God's Word, but you have to do something with it. Not just hearers. We study and obey Scripture. I had a uh, friend that was telling me, I, I visited a friend down in Melbourne while we were down in Central Florida. We went yesterday and visited a friend, and her father is suffering from dementia. He is aware of it, thankfully. Um, but... She was saying that one of his best friends they had to take to the hospital, and he had started suffering from dementia. And where he is living, I guess, was a home, and they come back, and it's got the sliding glass doors, and they start to walk up to the door, and he sees his reflection. And he says, who's that? Daughter says, that's you. That's your reflection. No, that's not. She said, yeah, it is. He said, no, that's an old man. I'm not, and he broke down. And it breaks your heart, but it, that's what I think of here, is not realizing what you really are. You look into God's Word, it's going to tell you what you are. You're a sinner. I don't have to tell you that. God's Word is going to tell you that. But the question is, have you dealt with it? And are you working on it? Are you studying His Word and trying to follow His Spirit and improve on whatever life that we're living? Are we not the same creature that we used to be? If fruits of the flesh and fruits of the Spirit are both evident, then looking into God's Word will make it clear whether or not we're producing fleshly fruit or godly fruit in the things that we are doing. The important thing is that we not only read and understand, but that we obey it. Who has Luke 17, 1 through 4? Thank you, Ms. Tess. Jesus said to his disciples, Things that cause people to stumble are bound to come, but woe to anyone through whom they come. It would be better for them to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around their neck than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. So watch yourselves. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. Um, the first part of the first verse there in Luke 17, what did that say? Things that cause people to stumble. Does somebody else have a different translation or a different? Temptations to sin. Temptations to sin, you said? That word that means that whole phrase is a Greek word called skandalon. S-K-A-N-D-A-L-O-N. It literally refers to those, you know, you, I can't do it. I'm, I love hunting, but I can't. I've never been one that sets traps. But those little tripwire traps that you do for a rabbit or something where you take a look, it is referring to that type of a snare. It is something that is set out to trap you to catch an animal or to catch you. That is the word that is being used there when it says these things will come along. What does it sound like in that Greek word, scandalon? Scandal. 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 That is exactly where our word scandal comes from. Those things that start scandals, it's those snares, those traps that come along. And it's scripture there, that people, that ought to make us a little bit scared. It does me says it would be better for you to have a millstone put around your neck and thrown into the ocean to cause somebody than to cause somebody else to stumble. We got to be careful how we're walking because people are looking. People are looking. We must each pay attention to ourselves, but we must also pay attention to our brothers and sisters in Christ, not do something to cause them to st stumble. And the scripture also says to forgive liberally. Now, I know it says 70 times 7 in, in there, and I was joking with my brother the other day because somebody had done something, and, and he's like, he, he was just upset. And I said, well, if I do it another 148 times, then I think you're all right. 
It's not what it means. That's a, a number that's referred to in Scripture as a complete number. In other words, continuously. We have to continue to forgive. In order to have these sorts of relationships with each other, we have to be closely united in the body of Christ and each walking in the Holy Spirit. Who has 1 Timothy 4, 7 through 8? Please, sir. Have nothing to do with godliness, myths, and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly, for the physical training is of some value, but godly, godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. And 1 Corinthians 9. Don't you know that in a stadium the runners all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Every competitor exercises self-control in all respects. They do it to receive a perishable crown, but we do it to receive an imperishable one. So I run in this way, not aimlessly. So I box in this way, not beating the air. Rather, I punish my body and bring it into submission so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. I run this way, not aimlessly. I have a direction. I have a guide in the Holy Spirit. And I don't just shadow box. It says not boxing in the air. I am training with a purpose. I am disciplining. He's talking about the scripture. I don't, I don't, I'm not saying that he didn't, but nothing tells us that Paul was a runner, an Olympic trainer. He is talking about scripture. Conditioning that body. It is so much more important because he says in the scripture that uh, I think she read, like I said, I can't remember who read which ones, but says that uh, Tessie read that um, training your body is a good thing. You know, we don't want to be breaking down too prematurely. We want to continue to be able to serve God. That's important, but so much more important is to train our spiritual lives to be following and guided by the Holy Spirit and working on that one. You know, I, I knew guys literally at the sheriff's office barely make it to work on time, but they get their backside up at 4 o'clock in the morning and go work out in the gym for three hours. Okay, they had nice bods. And what? That body's going to hell and going to be burnt. I, I know that sounds terrible. What is more important? That body's not going to be permanent. Thankfully, this body's not going to be permanent. I got a new one coming. That's taken care of because that is eternal. Scripture tells us to discipline or train ourselves to godliness, meaning that we actively strive to live according to his will for our lives. The study of Scripture is one important spiritual discipline, but there are others not limited to. Scripture memorization, I used to do that, and I'm glad I did because I can't remember nothing anymore. Somebody will say something about a verse, and I can a lot of times finish the verse. I remember, don't remember where it's at. Couldn't tell you, you know, where, where it's at, but that's in me. From when I was young, scripture memorization is important. Prayer, evangelism, reaching out. These are things that we're told to do. And that's in obedience, living the way that we're supposed to. Worship, serving, stewardship, as Lee said before. Do you ever reach the point in our Christian lives where we finish growing and maturing? No, no. What happens in the human body when it stops growing and maturing? I, sorry, but I think we're all old enough in here to know that. There's a certain point to where, you know, we joke about over the hill. It don't get any better from here. It is breaking down and it is dying. The same thing is true there. That's not a threat. That is a something to look forward to. We're going to continue to mature spiritually, or we should be if we're walking with the Spirit. And then when we stop, then that, hopefully that's because we have died and we're standing because to be uh Dead on this earth is to be standing in the presence of Christ if we're believers, or he parts those skies and comes again, one way or the other. That's what we're supposed to do. It's going to happen physically. We know that. It should be happening spiritually. We should be continuing to grow. The Galatians passage we started with clearly shows us that as long as we live in these bodies of flesh, there will always be a battle. There will always be a temptation to follow the flesh, but the Spirit should be our guide. Uh, Scripture is clear that it's possible to reach a spiritual maturity, but that's a maturity, not a completion. So Ephesians 4, 11 through 16 says this. This again is Paul writing to the church 
in Ephesus 4, 11 through 16. And he himself gave us some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, equipping the saints for the work of the ministry to build up the body of Christ until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son, growing into maturity with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. There will no longer be little children tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning with cleverness and the techniques of deceit. We will no longer be immature children and immature believers. We will be mature. We will be grown. We, and, and in unity is what it says there in that scripture. 1 Corinthians 13, 11 speaks of no longer being a child and putting away childish things. So we do reach a point of some maturity. Hebrews 5, 11 through 14, Paul talks about being spiritually mature and no longer needing milk. We should be growing. We should be eating meat. Like I'm talking about my grandchild. She, I think, gets one bottle a day now, and that's for the nutrients that are in it because she eats food with no teeth and all. We no longer should be needing milk, but those senses have been trying to distinguish uh, between good and evil as we mature. However, that does not me ever mean that we reach a point where future growth and maturity is not necessary and possible. Philippians 1.6 speaks about completion of our salvation does not come until the day of Jesus Christ. And Philippians 3.12-14 is where Paul talks about not having reached the goal of perfection, but he is striving to take hold of it. Those scriptures should be on your sheet. So... In conclusion, walking in the Spirit is choosing to live according to the manners and behaviors of God every single day. Life in the Spirit is in direct opposition to life in the flesh. said that at the very beginning of the Scripture. The Spirit and the flesh both have distinct and evident behaviors associated with them. We'll know we're, they'll know we're Christians by our love. I know that's the song we used to sing 40 years ago, but it's also biblical. They'll know we are Christians by us showing our love. Living according to the Spirit is not a one-time decision. It is a daily decision. It is something we must work on continuously, minute by minute. In order to walk in the Spirit, we need to mature spiritually. And our journey of spiritual growth will not end until either God takes us home or God comes again, one way or the other. That's when it's finished. Until then, we should be continuing to work on our spiritual maturity. Next week, we'll be looking at John 13, verses 1 through 20, and talking more about serving faithfully in the body of Christ. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for the encouragement and the reminder that this is not a one, once and done. This is a daily choice that we have to make. Follow the Spirit or follow our flesh. Father, I pray that it is evident that we are your children and that the Spirit is alive and well in us, and we are not just ambling about aimlessly or running around in circles, but we are following the Holy Spirit and His guidance in our lives so that we can become mature believers in Jesus Christ. I pray these things in your name. Amen. Thank you.